Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It doesn't sound like my mic is coming out. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Post my iPad. Can you go to my microphone actual? So layer one, like input seven or eight. Make sure that it's selected to the front of the house. So select it, the green button, and then on the top right, you should see front of house and mono bus. Make sure those are illuminated. Do you need me to come back there? All right, hold on. No. Hello. Good morning. Go ahead and save that scene over so we don't run into this again the next time, Doug. All right, we are in week two of our apologetics class, and this week is user uh, interaction, class member participation. Yes, we have, and, and that hopefully will be the case moving forward. We have a couple of videos today, and what I'm going to ask you to do as you watch the video is to imagine that you're neutral, that you're not predisposed to believing in Scripture as the Word of God. You're not predisposed to believing that there is a God. Imagine monobus. Test, 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 test. Well, you're not selected to my channel. That would be why. Okay, so save, save, confirm. All right, if you didn't hear me last time because uh, we had technical difficulties, this is, this is class participant week. We are going to have a couple videos. Imagine that you are not predisposed to believing that God is God that you are not predisposed to believing that the Word of God is actually God's Word. Imagine you are that skeptic that you are talking to. And I want you to, from that perspective, if you can, hear the argument, hear the, the case that's being made about there not being a God or, or trying to tear down the argument for God. Because it's important. Are we getting it in the stream, Doug? Is the stream going? Can you hear it in the stream? If you put the Bose headphones on, can you hear my voice? Just put the Bose headphones on and see if you hear me in those headphones. Okay, the stream is yellow. But can you hear my audio in the stream? Would you just put the Bose headphones on and tell me, can you hear me? Can you hear me in the headphones? Yeah, waiting, waiting, hearing. Okay, good. All right. Wow, lots of technical difficulties this morning. Why don't we just stop, pray, and move forward? And uh, Lord, uh, we seek to understand you. We seek to have our minds engaged. We seek to have our hearts engaged, Lord, to understand uh, your uh, invisible attributes, as Paul says in Romans 1, your, uh, your, your divinity, your eternal power, Lord. And as we look at these thinkers from the past, today and how they perceived the world and, and how they saw your fingerprints on creation, Lord, that we would be able to take that knowledge and be able to share that in a loving way uh, with those who, who are not believers, to tear down those boundaries, Father, to, to uh, participate with you in the work of evangelism, uh, Lord, and that your word would, as you promised, not return void. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so that's enough introductory stuff. Uh, as always, our goal in this class is to help us identify why do you believe in the Christian faith? And we, we've taken a, a quote out of Peter here. It says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So, um, this is not just mental assent to the Word of God, right? This is a deep-seated belief that changes the way we behave. That's why he says, in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord. And part of doing that is always being able 
or being prepared to make a defense to anyone, to answer, that's that apologetic, to be able to defend to anyone who asks you why you have this hope, but being able to do it in a way that is gentle and respectful. Um, Paul also said to uh, speak the truth in love. And so that's what we seek to do. Uh, as promised, this is a 14-week course. Also, as promised, I took all the animations off of this slide. Uh, we are going to break down this first of three categories or strategies. Remember last week we talked about strategies of apologetics. We're going to break down the first one, the evidential arguments, into two weeks. This may grow beyond a 14-week course as I begin to look at the presuppositional arguments. And again, we are not going to cover in their own um, uh, class the experiential arguments for God. And what we're going to do with these first four is we're going to build a case that there are questions about the universe that need answers. And then in week five, we're going to say that the best answer that fits all of the questions is the God of Scripture. And then we're going to talk about how that God of Scripture includes a divine person of Jesus Christ. We want to be able to answer why we are Christians and not just theists like Jewish or um, Muslims. And, and part of that, next, the week after that, is to explain, uh, as best we understand it, the mystery of the Trinity, so that we can't be accused of being poly, many theists, right? We only believe in one God, just like it says in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, Shema Yisrael, right? Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God is one so uh, we want to explain how that is true even with three persons. And then you can read the rest. That is a tentative list of where we're going to go. Obviously, if we get feedback that folks want to hear about, hey, what's a good apologetic for abortion? What is a good apologetic for the egalitarian movement, right? Feminism in the church today. What's a good apologetic for, uh, uh, I can't even think, war? Right, like the Second Amendment's a big deal now. You know, what, what do we as Christians have to say scripturally uh, about owning firearms? So we can go into any, any one of those. Just let me know, and I will prepare a lesson that, that digs into the biblical study of that, that gives an answer. Uh, so this is the overview of the course. We're going to show that there are questions that need to be answered. The best answer to that is the God of the Bible, and that once we say the God of the Bible is the best answer, how does that affect our lives? Sorry about the animations. Uh, I do have three new video references for you. Again, if you get the handout online by going to our church's website and then click resources, you can find this handout available. Uh, I'm sorry they did not get printed out this morning and put on the front table. I will get some printed out uh, and have them available between... Sunday school and church, though. Uh, William Lane Craig is a popular apologist. Uh, he's not necessarily a guy that everybody advocates for because he has a particular type of belief called Molinism, which we could talk about, but it's this idea of middle knowledge of God. Alvin Plantinga, uh, he does like our animations to try to show uh, what he's talking about. Like I said, this is uh, a deep thinker. Right, he's 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 a heavyweight. He's the guy that uh, you have to have your um, thinking cap on when you when you read him. And then Robert Lawrence Kuhn has a whole series of closer to the truth videos uh, that are very helpful. So I want to read a video for you, and I want you to listen. This is an interview with a philosopher who is not a Christian, and he is explaining what he thinks about the evidential arguments for God, right? The thing we're going to dive into today, he's going to explain how he hears those arguments. So if I could get the lights, Doug, and I will run that video. That's why form arguments, Al says, do not much matter. That won't work for Daniel Dennett. 
He's a leading philosopher who does not believe in God, and not shy about trumpeting his unbelief. We meet in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at his suggestion, in a church. Dan, I would really like to know whether God exists, and I've been asking a lot of smart people questions. And most of the people who don't believe in God would seek to attack and, sh and undermine the arguments of those who do. Fine. I'd like to flip that around mm -hmm. and say, what are the affirmative arguments for non-belief or for atheism? Well, I think the first one it simply has to be, uh, this is the way naturalism always argues. I mean, the burden of proof is, is, is sort of on the other side. Uh, don't multiply entities beyond necessity. So uh, the main reason for atheism is what for? What do we, what do we, need, what do we need God for? Especially since we've got a, a surfeit of reasons for seeing why in the absence of a God, we would nevertheless believe in God. I mean, there's plenty of natural arguments explaining why this false belief would arise. So we don't have the puzzle of, gosh, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, where there's so much belief that God must exist. No, I think we can just set that aside. So now the question- As neutral. As neutral. Yeah, so that, that, that cuts no real ice here. So now the question is, uh, if there's no positive argument for the existence of God, then we should just assume there isn't one. For the same reason, we should assume that there isn't um, a gog. Um, what's a gog? Well, it's a, a sphere of copper two miles in diameter with the word gog stamped on it. Um, and it's outside the light cone. So we can never see it. <laughs> we have no reason to posit its, its existence, so we might just as well assume it doesn't exist. So the, the core yeah, concept yeah. is that the burden is on the other side. Sure. All right, hopefully I muted my mic as I was back there troubleshooting video problems uh, with Doug. All right, what did you take out of that? What is his, as an atheist, what is he thinking about these evidential arguments? Well, you say they don't need to prove it. The atheist says the burden of proof is on our, our side to say whether there is a God, right? He says God could be anything, right? He talked about this Gog thing. He said, how do you know that doesn't exist? So he is, he's putting on Christianity or theism to be uh, less specific, that you have to prove the existence of a divine being. And then he makes this claim that the evidential arguments, the formal arguments for God don't matter because what's their source? Do you remember him saying that? What's the reason we have these formal arguments for God? He said we have a surfeit of reasons for people to invent a God, right? And he doesn't list them. He just says that they're there, that there are natural explanations for why people would want to invent a God. So he said with that line of evidence, that destroys the possibility of showing an evidential argument for God because for us, the theists, we're just responding to how we're naturally evolved to be. And so when we make a case, an evidential-based case for God, it has to be able to answer the question, the, the doubt that the atheist has. They're already thinking you're just saying this because it's a crutch to you. You need this to get through life because you're not brave enough to face the mean world without God. And so you've invented a God. And so that, that means all your evidential, your formal arguments can't be true. And the burden of proof is still on you. So, so that's the question. That's the question that the atheist uh, is going to ask of us. And that's our charge. That's our challenge is to pick that up and put that burden of proof and, and to answer that. Because we can. Yes, Connie. Correct. Correct. Because we, we see all these questions we can't answer, and the easiest answer to them is that there's a God. But because that's the easy answer, it can't be true. That's fundamentally what they say. Right? Like, 
I came home, the glass to my front door was broken, and the things in my house were missing, the obvious answer is somebody broke the glass and stole my stuff. Well, naturally you would think that. But aren't there other possible answers? Couldn't it be that a bear came through and, and you know, or, or whatever? And that's what the atheist is going to do, is they're going to give a, pleth a whole bunch of uh, possible but highly unlikely answers and discount the obvious easy answer. And we know this is true because this is exactly what Paul says in Romans 1, right? He says, although it was evident from creation, the invisible attributes of God, namely his divine power and his eternal divinity, but they exchanged the truth for a lie. They, they took the easy answer and they exchanged it for a lie. So we're, we're going to walk through the easy answer and we're going to provide these evidential arguments and then we're going to go make an argument that says, actually, the foot is in the other shoe, or the shoe is on the other foot, right? You all who think you know anything can't really know anything unless there is a God. And, and fundamentally, that's going to be, if, you're, if you believe natural selection is the survival of the fittest, then your mind did not evolve to know truth. Your mind evolved in the direction of survivability. And truth is not a necessary or high-equipped answer to survivability. So even though you think you know something, if you're a product of naturalism, all you really think you know is what natural consequences told you you need to know, so you don't really know anything at all. And, but we'll develop that a little more formally. So uh, we, we're going to go over four main uh, evidential arguments. Remember, the idea of evidential arguments is you look at the world and you presuppose that what you can see and observe in the world reflects truth. And we are made in such a way that we can understand that relationship. Right? Like, I look over and I see it's really far down and I know how strong my legs are and if I jump, I'm going to break both my legs. Right? There's a correspondence between reality and the truth, and so I make decisions about not jumping off of whatever's really high. Right? That's, that's what these evidential arguments are, are going for. And the first two, the two we're going to look at today, are what are called the cosmological. That's its formal name. Did anybody in school get to see Carl Sagan's video, Cosmos? It opens up talking about people are just dust of the stars, and the reason we yearn for the stars is that's where we came from. And he tries to make this case that the universe is either cosmos or chaos. So cosmos is this idea of there are causes and there are effects. And if you do A, B will happen. Because A happened, B exists, right? It's cause and effect. So in a cosmos, there is order. The next argument we're going to look at is the teleological argument, which is design and purpose. A didn't just happen to happen. It happened so that B would happen because we needed B to happen. It shows design and intention and purpose. Like when you get into a car accident and your airbag goes off. That is not evolution in a car that's natural means, right? There were designers that put sensors in your car and carefully calculated uh, explosive devices in the airbag. They made the material out of, uh, in the airbag out of, a, out of a product that wouldn't rip and explode, right? If you get the right kind, it's even got fancy metal shavings in it that can you know, blow through that and cut you out. The, the airbag recall, that was the big deal. If you own a Toyota, sorry, you're primarily affected. So, but we know that, right? We look at the airbag and we don't say, well, what a happy accident. We, we, we say this was designed with a purpose, right? If I get into a wreck, the airbag goes off. And so we look at the universe and we say, is there evidence? Are there fingerprints of a designer there? So everybody with me? Cause and effect, design and purpose. So... 
let, let me just warn you too. These arguments were developed by dudes in the kind of 400 before Christ and then um, not perfected but, but honed in on by guys from the 13th century, the 1200s. They did not have Netflix. So they were a lot more thinkery type people than we tend to be. So put in your waders. Understand we're talking about dudes from almost a 1,000 years ago you know, they didn't have Jack Daniels and Netflix. So they, they, they paid attention to things a lot more than we did. So I love this dude. Look at that fancy haircut, by the way. You know what? They did that on purpose to look like the crown of thorns. And since they were Roman Catholic, they couldn't get married. So, you know, ladies didn't have to dig it. But you can actually see he had male pattern baldness going on, that little gap that's up there. Um, you know, if he had had long hair, he'd have been the guy with the big... That's Thomas Aquinas. So the question that we try to answer with the cosmological argument was, does the cosmos, the universe, stand alone and unsupported? Is it just is? Or is it dependent on something else? Are there things happening to the universe that cause it to change? That we can track back and say, well, this is an effect. Therefore, there must be a cause. That cause is an effect of something else, so it must have had a cause. And we'll, we'll look at the consequence of that. So the argument here is that the universe is not eternal and unchanging and unaffected, but rather we live in a universe that is dependent. And this seems pretty obvious, right? Like you put seeds in the ground and they grow. Green beans. Thank you, Al Harris. If, if he had not planted those, green beans would not have grown there, right? That's a dependent situation. Cause, planting the green beans, effect, green beans grow, right? And so reasoning that there are causes and there are effects in the universe that we can look, can we make an argument and that Latin word, a posteriori. Anybody know what that means? Have you ever run into this in any of your reading? It means after you have experienced or observed something. So after you have experienced it. So this is something that you have to actually observe before you can know it. There's, there's another version that we'll look at, especially with the presuppositional that are not a posteriori. And we'll get there when we get there. But, but understand, these are things people have to have seen. So if you're going to argue from cause and effect, you cannot um, make the case with things people don't understand. Right? Like you can't go to Ethiopia and talk about the, the rain cycle and high altitude and snow. because They don't have snowy mountains there. So that's not going to work, right? So... so one of our objectives is when we, we, we learn these arguments, we learn to make them where people are. Right? If somebody, like in my line of work, before I you know, became a pastor five years ago, was in nuclear power. So I could talk about all kinds of incredible coincidences with the atomic structure and relationships like that that would not play in a middle school, right, or outside of that particular environment. So just keep that in mind. That's a little pastoral advice about using this case. Uh, so this, this cosmological argument was first put forward by Aristotle. I'm sure everybody's heard of Aristotle, right? There was um, Socrates, or if you're a Bill and Ted fan, Socrates, right? He was called the, the gadfly of Athens. He's the guy that said, the life unexamined is not worth living. He questioned everything. And the Greek thinkers didn't really care for that, so they made him drink the hemlock. His famous student was a guy named Plato. It means broad shoulders. He was a wrestler. Not, not W-R-A-S, not like W-W-E, but like, you know, Athenian Games wrestler. Buff, built dude, also really smart. So there's not exclusivity there. His most famous student was Aristotle. 
Aristotle's most famous student, by the way, anybody know? Alexander the Great. The conquest of the world was actually a scientific expedition. So, this in in the in the third century A.D. I'm sorry, fourth century A.D. He first saw causes and effects and, and started making this case. And Aquinas, the guy whose fancy picture we see up there, is the guy that kind of um, modified it or formalized it in part of his five ways. Argument. So this was part one of his five ways of showing the existence of God. So here's the syllogism. Um, syllogism is the formal steps of an argument. So step one, there are effects in the world. The cosmos is an effect, right? Stars collapse. Uh, hydrogen fuses in stars. That makes heat. It also makes light. That heat and light go to planets. They melt water. Water's available for life. It evaporates and creates an atmosphere. Right? There's cause and effect. We know that. The cosmos itself is an effect. Scientists today argue that. Right? They say there was a big bang. They don't go before the big bang to say what caused everything, all the matter and energy in the world to be in a single point. Right? But they say there was a big bang. So so everybody agrees there is an effect. And by definition, an effect is something that had a cause. I mean, just you cannot say this is an effect unless something caused it, because then by definition it would not be an effect. This is, this is the law of non-contradiction. You can't say that is an effect without a cause. That's like saying you're a... Um, father with no child, or a husband with no wife, or a bachelor, but you're married, right? Like, by definition, those things can't be true. And since there are causes, something has to start this situation up. You cannot have an infinite regress of causes. And the most obvious reason why is that it takes time for a cause to produce an effect. And so if we go back to infinity, how long would it take to get here? If the starting point was infinitely ago, how long would it take to get here? Same amount of time, right? Infinity. And when do you get to infinity? Never. Right? It, it cannot add up that it goes back for forever or we wouldn't literally be here now. We'd still be waiting to get here because we are at a point on infinity. But the starting point was infinitely ago. So you can't get to now if the starting point was infinitely ago because we would be infinitely far from that. It's, it's logically impossible. It, it can't exist in reality that we could have a now if the starting point was infinitely ago. Hold that thought because... This is why God is necessarily different from our existence. He's not of us, and we are not of his being. His being is separate from ours. Since there was a first cause, it has to have the ability to produce every effect that we can see. Whether that be the power of a star or the reproductive cycle of um, humans, right? The intricacies involved with it. Everything you see has to go back at some point to a cause. And we can't have an infinite number of causes for the same reason we can't go back to infinity. Now, it's possible there could be many causes, many unique causes, but that argues against itself out of complexity, especially if you're a naturalist, right? You always seek kind of the single easy answer. And so we're going to make the case that this first cause is God. So there are effects in the world. Effects must, by definition, have causes. Those causes cannot go back for forever, or we would never be here now, which means there had to be some first cause that has the power to produce 
and the intelligence to produce every effect that we can see. And so we're going to argue in week four that that best answer is the God of the Bible. But even if you don't say it's the God of the Bible, it's still a being much different from what we are. I can't make a star out of nothing and put it 100 billion miles away and make the light appear today right now so I can see it. I can't. No human can. Right? We're talking about something with incredibly more power than what we have when we're talking about this first cause. Now, what does the skeptic have to say about this? And, and here, again, is participation. I want you to think, as you watch his video, what are the two strongest uh, opposition points that he makes in his video? And you can actually pull the video up. There you go. One, the next and equally important step in philosophy is critical evaluation. So what do we make of them? As philosophers, if you think an argument is flawed, it's your job to try and figure out why. And by and large, philosophers, theists and atheists alike, have been relatively unimpressed by these four, having found many problems in them. For one thing, these arguments don't seem to establish the existence of any particular god. Even if the arguments are correct, it doesn't look like Aquinas gets us to the personal loving god that many people pray to. Instead, we're left with unmoved movers and uncaused causers who seem to have little in common with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who feels emotions and cares about his creation and answers prayers. Basically, this objection says that Aquinas' God is so far removed from the God that theists actually believe in that it doesn't help anything. But maybe you're happy just believing someone's out there. That's fine. But then, how about multiple someones? Because guess what? Aquinas' arguments don't rule out polytheism. There's nothing in any of his arguments to prove that God isn't actually, like, a committee. Aquinas' cosmological arguments also don't prove the existence of a sentient God. So it might be an old guy with a beard, it might be six old guys with beards, but it also might be an egg or a turtle or just a big block of stone. These observations have made some philosophers uncomfortable with Aquinas' ultimate conclusion. But there are two objections that are thought by some to be real nails in its coffin. The first is simply that Aquinas was wrong in his insistence that there can't be an infinite regress of anything. Aquinas takes it as a given that there had to be a starting point for everything, whether it's the movement of objects or causes and effects or contingent beings being created. But it's unclear that this is true, or why it has to be true. If infinite regress can be possible, then Aquinas' first two arguments fall apart. But perhaps the most significant charge made against Aquinas' arguments is that they're self-defeating. That is, they actually prove themselves wrong. For example, if Aquinas is right that everything must have been put into motion by something else, and everything must have a cause other than itself, then it seems that God should be subject to those same stipulations. And if God is somehow exempt from those rules, then why couldn't other things be exempt? from them too. If they can't exist without God being responsible for them, then we don't need God to establish things in the first place. All right, I feel like I've given you a lot to think about. Some of the arguments he made were if everything, everything must have a cause, what caused God? What did you guys think from what he said? What were some of the stronger points you think he was making? If, if, you weren't predisposed, if you were not predisposed to believing in God and you heard that, what were some of the stronger points he was making? Yeah. The God he's imagining certainly is, right? The God he thinks is being argued for by this argument is subject to the same rules that the argument is, right? Right, that's his point, right? If, if everything that exists had to have a cause than what caused God? I mean, that seems like a pretty tough question to answer, right? There's a reason why it seems very tough to answer, and, and we'll get to that on the next slide. Uh, they also would make the case that there is no such thing as cause and effect. It only appears that things are caused and effect. This is actually a very strong argument 
that resulted in a very famous um, argument for existence. Uh, cogito ergo sum is the Latin phrase, but I think, therefore I am. You ever heard that expression? We'll talk about that in a few weeks too, where that came from. What about the case he made that it says this doesn't require there to be only one God? Did that seem like a pretty, yeah, that's true. It could be that there were multiple versions of this thing called God, right? There's a lot of ways we can answer that. The ontological argument is probably the best, but also, well, next slide, we'll get to that. What about his saying, this God isn't personal, he's not sentient? Is that, is that true about this uncaused cause, this, this reasoning back from cause and effect? Does the original cause have to be a personal loving God? Not necessarily, which is why Aquinas had five ways. Each one doesn't stand on its own, but they stand cumulatively. You think about a table that has, well, in Aquinas' case, it was five legs. But today, we've got hundreds of legs standing up on that table. So if an atheist takes one leg out, the table doesn't fall. But when they go pull the next leg out, it has to pull that leg back in. See, when you start arguing about the, the personal type God, that no longer defeats the cosmological argument because it was never trying to talk about whether that's a personal God anyhow. It's just talking about whether or not there was a cause for all of the causes and effects that we see, or rather, all of the effects that we see. So whether he's personal or not, that's not the question we're trying to answer with that. So if you say your answer doesn't answer a different question that I have, you say, yeah, I wasn't trying to answer that question. No kidding. In fact, the cosmological argument doesn't argue that everything has a cause. Did you hear how he changed the argument? He didn't say every effect has a cause. He said everything must have a cause. That's not the cosmological argument. It is every dependent thing, everything that changes, everything that is an effect has a cause. But what is God? Yes. I mean, it, it couldn't be without something causing it. So it is dependent on something else causing it. But what does God say in his word about himself? Am I a man that I would change? Right? God says over and over in his word that he does not change. Now, do you really think that Moses in 2500 AD was thinking forward to Aristotle's cosmological argument and said, I better write this down so that 2,000 years from now, when this question comes up, I can, I can have an answer ready to go? Or was God saying that because it's really true of God? I don't know why I got kicked off of my screen mirroring. Did the Mac fall asleep or something? All right, just leave it alone. What's the code? So it's a fallacious argument to say that everything must have a cause. He's arguing against a question or a statement we never made. We didn't say everything must have a cause. We said every effect must have a cause. So you've got this, yes. That is the effect, is the change that the cause caused. So, uh, Doug... On the Mac computer, there's a, a little program running called NDI Scan. And you can actually select the um, reflector program in one of the windows. So if you go to File, so 
so that the stream is, is looking wonky. We'll just move forward with it the way it is up here. All right. What about there's no such thing of cause and effect, which he didn't make in his argument, but this is something. Well, if that's true, then the word effect doesn't actually have any meaning at all. And if you can't communicate with words that have meaning, just give up, right? Like, pass me the salt, and they hand you what we all agree is salt. You say, no, 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 the salt. And he, he's like, this is the salt. No, no, that's just the salt to you, right? Like, we have to have some base level of agreement on what words mean. So uh, what about this only requires one God? Are you guys familiar with Occam's razor? Occam's razor is the simplest answer is the most likely answer. And if you're going to argue for multiple gods, and, and, and so that's a summary of Occam's razor, but it is a rigorous logical truth. You cannot, without other evidence, select the more complex thing and have it be logically true. So of the choices, multiple gods or a single god, both are logically possible. There's no reason to think multiple gods is true. So by logic, the, the rigor of logic, you must say the one god is true. Doug, are you not able to pull up the NDI scan? So up at the top, what does it say is the window that you've got open? See where it says file at the top? At the top? Yeah, file. What do you, no, other side. Is that file? Click that. What does it give you? So windows is one of those windows uh, in, uh, reflector. I can't even see what program you're actually on. What, what is it? What, what's the program it says you're playing with? Right next to the Apple logo? Yeah, so you don't want Reflector 4, you want NDI scan. So click in the window. So now scroll down to Reflector 4. Is that NDI scan? No, you don't want file. Go ahead and click out of there. Somewhere on the desktop, that's not that. Now go down to NDI scan, the program on the bottom. NDI scan converter. Now you see how it says NDI scan converter at the top? That tells you that's the active program. Now click the file or the window or whatever it says. Now up at the top again. See at the top where it says NDI scan converter? Yep, file. And now there should be a reflector. And then see the window that's like 1980 by something? In parentheses. There you go. Click that. This is worse than the cosmological argument. All right. Um, so what about his argument that he said that uh, the evidence of the cosmological argument doesn't argue for a personal God? Well, there's a, a way of answering this that says, if that's true, if the God who created fact is not a personal God, meaning a God who's capable of making a choice, right, about what? I'm going to affect as, you know, what effects I'm going to create? Yeah. Then, then if it can't choose which effect and when that effect is going to happen, then every effect it's capable of doing would exist all the time because it can't decide what effect to produce, which we see as purpose, right? But if you think about it, uh, it's like your bank account. If you weren't personal and you were capable of spending all your money and you had no intellect or sentience about choosing what to spend it on, but the ability was there to spend it on, how much money would you have in your bank? Zero dollars, right? Because you would just produce all those effects because you could. So it doesn't make sense to argue against a personal choosing God if we see that choices have been made. There's only some effects. 
And we can see those effects demonstrate the power of God is he can do anything he wants. But he didn't do everything. He did particular things. Right? So, so that can't be true. You're just not thinking about it good enough, philosopher. So now let's go to um, the teleological argument. This is the, this is the design and purpose argument. What time we got? 15 minutes. We can make it. All right. Everybody following along so far? The cosmological argument is cause and effect. Now we're going to go to design and purpose. So the question is, are we orphans? Meaning we have no father, no parents, nobody who's guiding us and leading us, showing us the way, having created a path for us that we can follow? Or do we belong as citizens of the cosmos? So we, we make this case by showing that the universe could only exist with extremely precise fine-tuning. We show with sophistication in biology, uh, physics, the natural cycles that we see, you know, the moon uh, orbiting the earth. You, you know why the, the moon is so important? Have you ever spun a top? You know what a top is, right? A little toy with a point at the bottom, and it comes up, and it's got this mass around it, and you spin the top. What happens if the top is leaning over just a little bit when you start spinning it? If it's spinning fast, what happens to it? it stands up right straight, right? Well, the earth is really big, and it's spinning really fast, but it's on an angle. What should it do? It should go right back up straight, right? And, and as it does, it, it, get, it generates momentum. And so it should go past the center, and it should oscillate. And depending on the exact nature of things, it should flip over, maybe fall down, right? Maybe slow down. And so we can show with mathematics the only way to hold a spinning object whose mass is bigger in the middle, like the earth, right? It bows in the middle, but the middle isn't in line with the sun. It's tilted 23 degrees. The only way to do that is with a secondary object that orbits the earth. And it has to be a very specific size mass. If it's too big, it doesn't work. If it's too small, it doesn't work. Guess how big the moon is? Exactly the right size, exactly the distance away. What if there's no tilt on the earth? There's no summer, winter, spring, and fall. What if there's no seasons? Then you don't produce rivers that, that um, come from ice melts in the mountains that then erode the mountains onto the farmland that put all that fertile soil that we can grow food, that people can exist. If there's no people, there's nobody to give God the glory. God put the moon at just the right size, at just the right distance from the earth, and the tilt on the earth at just the right size, that not only do we have water, but we have water cycles so that we can exist to give God the glory. This is the idea of cosmic fine-tuning. We've known of hundreds of millions of other planetoid that circle around stars. Not one is similar to earth. And we keep looking and we keep finding none. This idea of cosmic fine-tuning is best um, described by what is called William Paley's watchmaker argument. And I want you to, to hear, again, this is Ravi Zacharias International Ministries video, but this is, this is kind of talking about that watchmaker argument. The design argument for God's existence argues that there is an implicit 
implicit and, and explicit design, order, purpose, and creation that points to a creator, a purposer, a designer. You can't help but look at the existence of life on this earth and how strong the odds are, you know, millions and millions to one, that everything aligned just perfectly. Scientists are telling us today that, we, that life in this universe is balanced on, on a knife's edge. They are about maybe, I think, about 50 constants of nature. And if they were changed to the slightest degree imaginable, life would not be possible. And they are independent of each other, all these constants. And for them to be, to have been put together, for them to, to have uh, come together to allow life, seems to cry out for intelligence, for, for intelligence behind the whole process. How far? the Earth is from the Sun, it seems to be just the perfect distance. How far is the Moon from the Earth? It seems to be just the perfect distance for life to begin existing. Where exactly are we in our galaxy? Our galaxy is the Milky Way. We happen to find ourselves in just the right place for just the right amount of radiation to allow life to exist. Where are we in our solar system? It turns out we're being shielded by an asteroid belt, something we would need in order for life to exist. Gravity has a wide range of, of, of constants where it could have been. It could have been one way, it could have been an entirely different way. And in fact, if we took the entire range of constants where gravity could have been set, and we turned that, that range into a ruler that expands the length of the universe, and we divide that up in one inch increments, so we're talking about a ruler, the length of the universe at one inch increments, gravity is exactly where it needs to be in order for life to exist. If it were one inch one way, everything would explode. If it were one inch the other way, everything would implode. And we're talking about gravity could have been anywhere on that, on that ruler, this cosmic ruler. And so we have to conclude the best explanation, again, is that mind, which we have good reason to believe through the intelligent design argument, is tampering with this dial in order for life to exist. I think the beauty of art, the beauty of, say, the Grand Canyon of the Swiss mountains, or the, the, the intricacies of nature, including the way that everything holds together to sustain and validate life or sustain life, are so complex that, to me, I just cannot accept that that could be purely random chance and necessity. I, I really, that takes more faith in my mind than to believe that there's a cosmic intelligence with uh, goodness, power, and grace who designed something in which people made in this image could live. What the intelligent design movement is saying is that we can identify messages in the world around us. We have the ability to say, okay, this message right here has come from an intelligent mind. Then we take what we've learned, we apply it to the world around us, and we say, wow, this world is the product of a mind. This isn't smuggling theism through the back door. This is just a fact. If we can determine that a mind is involved and we see that a mind is involved in the universe around us, that's the conclusion. And we should take our conclusions and run with them, not try to predetermine what our conclusions should be. That's bad science. This on? Okay. So the basis of the argument is that if we find evidence for design, there has to be a designer. Pretty simple, right? So the question is, is it really design or is it only apparently design? See, the, the skeptic, the critic would say that it, it isn't any actual design. It's just you are predisposed to recognize patterns and you want to recognize a pattern and call that design. So William Paley's um, watchmaker argument talks about this guy walking down a beach and he steps on something, it's hard, he picks it up and he notices, you know, it's just this brass machine thing, it's smooth, it's got a little ridges on the edge and it's got like a chain attached to it with a clip and he notices there's a bump on one side and when he presses the bump it poof, pops open. It had a spring that was charged inside of it that was, you know, seemed to function to open the lid. The button had a clasp that seemed to hold the, the front of the watch closed. It 
It almost seemed like they were put together on purpose that way to keep the sand and the dust out, to protect the, the piece of glass. And that piece of glass was interesting, he noticed, because you could see through it, but it was hard. So it protected these little fingers that were inside of it, and there were numbers on it. And it seemed like as the sun moved through the sky, the, the one little hand seemed to follow where the sun was. And it seemed like every single time the little hand went around 60 times, the big hand would move from one to the other. And he noticed it had this ticking sound to it that, that was pretty regular. He said, it seems like somebody made this thing to tell the time and, and put a lot of these features in place to protect it so that it would last a long time. And it was probably pretty precisely made because it did a really good job tracking the sun through the sky, the time of day. So an intelligent person would recognize that, hey, this also is created by an intelligent thing. And so there is a rebuttal video that we're not going to have time to show. But again, he changes the goalposts in his, he doesn't talk about um, purpose and design. He only talks about function. He doesn't talk about the relationship between this function and that function and that function. So he, he removes the guts of the design argument of purpose and only talks about these independent functions. Um, and so maybe we'll have to come back to this next week because none of that will make sense without seeing his um, rebuttal. Let me give you a summary about these two things. The cosmo cosmological argument reasons from cause and effect based on observing that that's what happens in nature. Right? We see it. We know this is an effect. It's repeatable. It's testable. This is the very foundation of science, right? Like, I have to be able to predict something, explain the, you know, the maths, the reasons why, and then test my hypothesis to see if it's true, change some of the conditions. If it's still true, you know, then I know I found the actual cause of that effect. If none of that were true, there'd be no science, right? So we see it. So with that being true, we can argue for a first cause. And then we briefly looked at the theological argument. We're going to have to come back to it uh, because there's so much more. But I want you to notice, both of these are not rigorous, logical proofs that if you're going to be a sentient, rational human being, you must accept. The reason is there are no rigorous, logical people. They're Star Trek excluded with the uh, Vulcans or whatever. There are no human beings that always act perfectly and believe perfectly reasonable and logical and rational. We buy things that are extravagant that we don't need. New pair of shoes, right, whatever it is, when, you know, rationally we could use that money to feed homeless people or something like that, right? But our heart is in it. We want to reward ourselves, whatever reason we give ourselves, right? There are, there are rational things that we could do, but we allow our created being that God made on purpose. That's not a critique of that, right? It's a statement of fact. And this is true of God's evidencing of himself in the world because he does not drag anybody into heaven kicking and screaming. He shares the truth, and there will be a time when the lie that was accepted will be exposed standing before God, and they will be accountable for that judgment. But you cannot expect, simply because you have shown beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you have overcome obstacles to faith. It's not reasonable or rational There is an element of faith, to, to, of, of heart change that's necessary for faith. Okay? And, we're, and I, I just want to re-emphasize that point, that as good as you can be about making a rational case for God, you're not going to overcome the barrier to faith. Only the Word of God and the power of God's Holy Spirit 
overcomes that barrier in a person's heart. Questions. Lots of them, right? So uh, email me, text me. We'll, we'll re-hit the, the watchmaker analogy at the start of next week. And hopefully we can figure out why our upload speed is getting choked down and ruining our stream. Yes. I'm sorry, two weeks from now. Yeah, August the 8th. And everybody's favorite slide, end of show. <laughs>